welcome to episode six of Heresy from the Haven. It's a Wobbly Goblin Adventure podcast coming to you from the Gamer's Haven in lovely Spokane, Washington. We are your hosts. I'm Bob Kelly. Steven. Jay Prickett here. So this is our intro series that we are doing. Uh, we're attempting to give a guide to new players on deciding if Horse Heresy is a game that they want to invest in and get involved in. Uh, in the past episodes, we've been covering different concepts and things that we, people might want to keep in mind uh, when they're choosing a force and building a force. Anything from, um, we've co- what have we covered so far? We've covered sportsmanship. Uh, things to think about when you're choosing your army. Right. Uh, how, to build, how to build an army. We haven't gotten into building the armies yet. That's right. A um, quick overview of different unit types. Yeah, different unit types we'll get into. Yeah. Um, Picking legions, anything from a story you've read or a character you love. Maybe you're coming from 40K and there's a character you love. Favorite color. Favorite color, right? There's all <laughs> sorts of different things that we've covered in the past. <laughs> Last episode, we dove into the Loyalist Legions. Kind of a kind of a quick um, summary. We're not getting into deep uh, dives on these legions. We will be Those are coming. in future episodes, yep, yep for sure. Um, in this episode, we're finally going to cover the good guys, the traitors. <laughs> the worst. <time>. Yeah. <laughs> The bad of the bad. We're going to be uh, discussing a bit of the story or the fluff, as a lot of people like to call it, which is the background of each legion, and kind of touch on the overall army rules, just touch on them. Uh, Each legion to give you an idea of how those armies play. We're doing the same in the next episode. We're going to be going over some of the non-legion factions, like uh, Custodes, uh, Solar Exilia, Mechanica, uh, Imperial Militia, and even Titans, Knights, things like that. Absolutely cool stuff. Our hope is that a new player can listen to this, this starting series and uh, kind of have the tools necessary to decide if Horse Harris is the game they want to get into and maybe kind of give them a rough idea of what faction or legion they want to start with. And a guideline of what not to do in the podcast. Yes, we're, we're real good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> uh, so before we dive into the Trader Legions, though, we realize that there is uh, some points that we haven't touched on in the story arc. So if you're not familiar with the Horse Heresy story, there is a series of books that's phenomenal called The Horse Heresy. That can really do a deep dive into a lot of this. There's not enough time in a podcast to cover a lot of these. But there are a couple of points that we haven't talked about um, when we're talking about the Loyalists and the Traitors and the Horus Heresy, the rebellion of Horus and his legions against the Emperor and his legions. But there's a couple, I think, key points that we need to talk about to help understand um, this. if this universe is new to you, uh, why some of the legions chose to join Horus's rebellion or stay loyal to the Emperor. Exactly, yeah. So I think the first part of that we haven't really touched on is the the chaos gods and the warp itself. The warp is, in fast, loose terms, mm-hmm. an alternate dimension filled with beings that are a reflection and manifested by the emotions created in our our universe, our galaxy, right? Yeah. So, for example, the four main chaos gods, Korn, Zinch, Nurgle, Slanesh, uh, Korn, as one example, is a manifestation of all the rage and anger of all the different races in this galaxy manifested the god Korn. Um, Slanesh was actually birthed because there's a race called the Eldar that got so deep into gluttony and lust and, and sloth and every other deadly sin you can think of that, that actually formed Slanesh, who's the god of pleasure, um, so it's, as we go into these trader legions, you'll see some of the legions tied themselves specifically to specific gods and the warp itself is a space that the, when the emperor of mankind discovered it, he realized that it was a way to travel from one point to another through that space much faster, but in doing so expose the traveler to all the evils of the warp or not safe at all pleasures horrors? pleasures of the warp i would say with horrors <laughs> well, you know horror wars i'm not gonna, gonna uh, judge anybody's kink is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so that's what that's podcast. what that's essentially what the, that's what, the, <laughs> that's what the chaos gods are uh very very quickly very loosely if you're not familiar with the universe and the warp itself there was a hole torn in, in reality that now there it's almost like a passageway between yeah. our dimension, our galaxy, and the warp, and it's from the warp that all the demons come, the cast of the gods live in the warp, but that's, that's the rough, rough synopsis, and that'll, that'll, like I said, that'll be, it'll help you understand some of the chaos legions, or the traitor legions, not chaos legions, that's where they're not chaos, not chaos yet, right, um, and how they, the chaos gods influenced 
this whole rebellion, this heresy, if you will. Yeah, let's just say again, of course, um, whatever legion you pick can be played as traitor or loyalist. Correct. Doesn't matter. Um, we kind of wanted to bring that up before we get to the traitors, of course, and it kind of comes back to something we talked about before um, called the Primarchs, mm -hmm. the, uh, the leaders of each legion, as it were. Uh, they're the genetically modified sons, uh, quote-unquote sons, of yeah. the emperor. Um, there are so many popular theories about their kind of origin, but as a quick overview, as the emperor was creating these 20 demigods, I like to call them leaders legions, they were scattered throughout the universe. To, to random planets, to random cultures. Yeah, the Emperor lost them. Yes, as before he almost completed them in terms of birthing them to their full age and raising them as own. Now, one theory, is, of course, is uh, the chaos was behind this. The chaos gods banded together to initiate this um, and, and break apart his plans. That was kind of the long-standing theory. More stories coming out that maybe yeah. they were scattered to keep them safe from chaos. Right. Safe from the Emperor, right? Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Either way, then growing up on different planets, again, with those different cultures that we talk about and customs, it really drives not only their, their tactics of warfare, but even their outlook on life and how they make decisions kind of going forward. So that's kind of going to bring that up really quickly again. It kind of shapes their culture thing of warfare. It's almost yeah. as if there was an uh, intelligent design as to when they were scattered across the galaxy, the planets they landed on were the ones that they probably fit the most to, and almost to a T, almost all of them ended up taking over that planet, mm -hmm. ruling that planet. Um, but yeah, all of this, again, not going deep dive into it. There's a lot you can read about this if you're not familiar with this uh, this, uh, this universe and story arc, which if you're going to get in, it's fantastic. It's a phenomenal story. But There's I think the main reason we're bringing it up right now is because the nine traitor legions went that direction because of one of the Right. Eight traitors and Alpha Legion. Well, yeah. nine traitors. For now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, on to our summaries of the traitor legions of the Horse Heresy. And that'll take us into the third legion, the Emperor's Children. Right. Yeah, we're doing them in order. Yep. And we did all the loyalists in order, leaving out, well, number two and 11. Nobody talks about number two and 11. Nobody knows anything about two and 11. I think Russ does. Russ probably does. Russ probably does. So in case you missed it again, check out the previous episode for the uh, Loyalists, as it were. Exactly. Uh, with the Third Legion, um, I think as I was kind of coming into this, I actually just completed um, a new Emperor's Children list I got from Stephen, and Stephen just didn't enjoy their fluff. Is that, was that how you put it? That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> because when you look up the... I try to come at this as... If you look in the dictionary or some sort of saying, Pride Before the Fall, you might find a picture of the Emperor's children. Or right. Fulgrim. Fulgrim. Yeah, the Primarch. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're led again by their Primarch, Fulgrim, as we just mentioned. Uh, they were actually one of the most dedicated followers of the Emperor as a legion themselves. Um, they were literally named after the Emperor, the Emperor's children. That's where that came from. They were the only legion, I believe, to actually be allowed to wear the, um, the Emperor's uh, is it Palatine Aquila. Yeah. It's actually simple. Yeah. Yeah, the kind of the double-headed winged eagle you kind of see all over uh, Warhammer lore. All space marines have it now. Yeah. But back then, it was just the Emperor's children. They are a legion who, who strives, even back in the original, before they turned traitor, they always strove to perfection. Um, they tried to master the art of war, especially close combat and kind of a dueling background. Uh, Fulgrim, he didn't really try to hone on any certain aspect of warfare. He was kind of being one to be the master of all and always strove that perfection. And that's where kind of this, this pride came in that we see. Again, there's a lot of great stuff in the books, but if you look at the Emperor's Children, Ful Fulcrum was convinced by Horus a few different theories, but Horus mainly played upon that, that's, of course, aspect of pride that Fulcrum had. You know, maybe working loyal to the Emperor, you can do so much better coming and being with me. You can achieve more perfection. And this kind the of played into... holding him back, yes. if you will. Interesting. This played into that uh, the Chaos God, Slanesh, we, we briefly touched upon. Pride. Pride. Lust. Pride before the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, so they actually turned traitor before the Istvan V uh, massacre. Right. They're one of the original original traitor legions. They played a part um, during the heresy all throughout it. On Istvan V, Fulgrim actually killed his brother, Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands. 
Right. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You spoil something in the future, or I don't remember those books we were talking about? Read them. Yeah. Uh, Ferris Mantle is still is still in the game if you want to play him, um, but just know his head is on Fulgrim's mantle somewhere <laughs> in the future. In the future, they were so close that if I'm not mistaken, they like made each other weapons. Yeah, Fulgrim they were actually they were brothers. Yeah, Fulgrim approaches Ferris Mass at one point to kind of recruit him to Horus' side, and and Ferris Mass is just he shut him down. And they just hated each other. I don't think Fulgrim at the end didn't even hate him still. He still kind of loved his brother. Um, kind of he had a taint of chaos with, um, I believe, a demon sword. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I forget what the name of it was. But, but, he, but he gave to Lucius. Yes. Yeah. They were part of the Siege of Terror itself. Mm-hmm. At the end of the Horus Heresy. Not really assaulting the walls. Kind of different stories. They were just kind of slaughtering the populace. Is a popular theory. Um, after the fall of Horus, they also just fled like the rest of the traitors. Um, I believe Fulgrim is still... Around today, he's in, a demon, in demon hood. Yeah. Yep. Uh, traditionally, they wear lots of purple and gold, uh, much imagery of eagles and the, kind of the winged motifs. Uh, very fancy boys, I call them. Oh yeah, yeah. a lot of gilded very in fancy armor. boys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a kind of cool thing um, to know about them is during the heresy, I guess even beginning, but towards the end of it, they really embraced uh, surgical augmentation. They started combining this kind of alien or, or Xenos technology into their own bodies and producing like uh, sonic weaponry, kind of just discordant energy that utilizes the warp. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. That plays into the rules as well. I'll kind of get to here in a little bit. But um, what are you guys' thoughts on the Emperor's Children so far? Well, it's kind of fun is in way early 40K, the Sonic Marines mm-hmm. and the Noise Marines, they were all just like 80s rockers, like. Their guns yeah, look like literally guitars, guitars and, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the mohawks and the leopard print and the whole bit. But uh, in in Horus Heresy now, they really excel in close combat. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the the rule sets in the game is when you fight in close combat, you base it off initiative. Whoever has the highest initiative strikes first. And Emperor's Children almost always have the highest initiative. That's one of their bonuses in their armies. Yeah, the anytime they charge, they always fight at one higher initiative, even their, their slower weapons. Right. Yeah. So I might be a beast in close combat. But if you're hitting me first, not so much. When I first started hearing about him, I was like, oh, samurai, badass. But then, what? slaughtering populace, as you said, and different things like that, yeah, I, I kind of don't really care for them anymore. <laughs> yeah, they have um, some pretty cool, pretty cool rights of war. Again, those rights of wars are kind of um, certain ways the book gives you rules to build an army to kind of different play style that might embody the Legion itself. They have a couple of them. One's called the uh, Maruskara. This is a pretty cool right of war that really plays into their idea of, of perfection in warfare. But they want to do it in like the most complex way possible. Um, so really, it's, it lets you take four units to give them the outflank ability. The outflank means these units can actually come um, on the battlefield in any, any edge. Like mid-game. Mid-game, yeah. turn two, they can just run on from any edge. And then the idea is the rest of your units actually get plus one movement. So you have all these units coming out on the edge. Your other movement's moving faster, and you kind of meet in the middle of this pincher movement. Um, it's just kind of this idea of a quick surgical strike and the perfection of warfare. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty cool one. Uh, the second one is called the it's third... Kind of art of war field, really. it, does. Yeah, it, does. it does. The second one's called the Third Company Elite. This one really plays into that surgical augmentation I was talking about before. It lets you take this special unit called the Cacophony Squads. And these are kind of the original noise marines, as you might have heard before from 40k, where they first started kind of bringing in these um, Xenos, again, alien technology, combining with their own technology into these kind of weird energy noise weapons. So you bring all these guys, and then this right of war makes you augment every unit in your army. So you're kind of really playing up that kind of slow fall into the embrace of chaos itself. And trying to perfect themselves. Yes. In their eyes, perfect themselves. Okay. They're just odd and gross looking. But yeah, they're, they're a pretty cool army. Um, again, you follow that slanesh, the kind of the purples and golds. I like how they look a lot. It's very beautiful. Yeah, it's a striking good. army for sure. Yeah. It's a great army if you want some unique uh, uh, units with ranged abilities, mm-hmm. with their sonic weapons, and then also... As a world leader player, I'll tell you, they're really good at close combat. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> they do have some really awesome uh, story-driven 
builds also right. for characters that you can use that are only loyalists and characters you can use that are only traitor. It's one that's got a lot of history. Yeah, I mean, you're doing yours as loyalist, and there's a character that's available to them that is only loyalist. So it, it, by building a loyalist force in that situation, you can't use Fulgrim because Fulgrim's traitor only, but he can use Saul Tarbitz, who yep. is a, uh, a, a loyalist character who refused to actually join the rebellion and survived the massacre of uh, Isfan, Isfan 3. 3. Yep, exactly. Yep. So we're mentioning Isfan 3 and Isfan 5. Again, they're in the books. So we're not going to deep dive into them. Great stories. Just kind of the two main events that kicked off the heresy. Yeah, probably. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it's a, okay. great, it's a great force. So uh, traditionally, after number three comes number four. And you were assigned number four as well. Which is the, which, the Iron Warriors. And I know, Bob, you have some history with them. Also a very cool legion, in my opinion, as well. Now, the Iron Warriors of the Fourth Legion, as I said, um, they are known towards their predilection to siege warfare, um, led by their pre-mark Perturabo. Right. Um, Perturabo is a, he's a character. He's a, he's a little bit jealous, I think you could say. Very you, jealous. You way yeah. to describe him. Um, he's, a, he's, he's just a vicious, and they just want to decimate their opponents in warfare. Mm -hmm. They were kind of known as the emperor would point them at any sort of, sort of siege that he would be taken care of, and they would just send wave after wave. Yeah, tactical genius, for no, sure. Then no matter what it took, yeah. no matter how Great many bodies died, they would get the job. <laughs> <laughs> and towards the end, as they got kind of their kind of fall to chaos, or not so much chaos during the heresy, but just kind of that anger that Perturabo had for his brothers. Again, he was a very jealous man. A specific brother. Rogel Dorn of the Imperial Fists. You bet. Dorn's dogs. Mentioned them last episode, but Rogel Dorn had a predilection for siege defense. Perturabo kind of challenged him in kind of the siege offense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stories even after. I thought um, it was reversed. I, did, I haven't read them in a long time. Yeah, but. there's actually a story even later in the heresy when, when Perturabo falls to, to chaos, he builds kind of this massive area and Dorn has to. And yeah. There's a whole bunch of stuff, too, about Siege Warfare. It's pretty cool. It's old Siege of the Emperor's Palace. Yep. Dorn defending and Perturabo attacking. Coming in, yeah. He wanted to be the one to break through, even before the palace, through Pluto, the whole Terran system. Yeah, and I think yeah. he didn't want to do it for any other reason. Is his jealousy of Dorn, he wanted to defeat yep. Dorn's defenses. He wanted to prove that he was better than Dorn was. Yes, yeah. So they, they played a huge part in the heresy. Um, and aesthetically speaking, they're actually a pretty simple um, army to paint. Oh, yeah. It's silver. You can make that army look so good. It's really, really some simple techniques that you can make. Maybe that throw in some famous hazard striping. Yep. Yep, if you want to. Black Sharpies. Black Sharpies. <laughs> I almost built them just so I could not have to paint. It's a rattle cannon and oils if you want, or washes. Yeah. yeah. Do some oils, do some battle damage. Black that's not, some not to say you can make Yellow areas and, yeah. then, uh, and then pen in some black stripes. And boom. Uh, lastly, kind of like the Iron Hands, the Iron Warriors kind of played into that cybernetic enhancement and augmentation. Um, and he also even had some Mechanicum units incorporated into their armies, kind of the robots we'll talk about later. So that's kind of aesthetically like, speaking like the Iron Hands was, was last episode. Now the Iron Warriors, they're pretty straightforward as a Legion itself in terms of the actual gameplay. Uh, their armory-wide rule is, is it's simple. So it's simple, <laughs> but it's so good. It's a plus one strength in combat or shooting. Against vehicles, dreadnoughts, buildings, or automata, which are the robots. So if you just think about that, we've kind of mentioned dreadnoughts before mm, and how very powerful how under costed they are. Yeah. So they're kind of everywhere. Well, if you have a whole army that can shoot dreadnoughts and kind of take them out pretty quickly, you have a you're you're doing something right on the tabletop. It really ties into their their the concept of them being able to crack siege, crack yep. armor, crack you know wall. They can they can they can break vehicles, break dreadnoughts, break yeah. It's... Yeah, the siege warfare also kind of comes up in their their kind of armory as it were. They can take uh, graviton close combat weapons, and that gives you this rule called haywire, which means you just you more easily wound dreadnoughts and automata those robots. And the other big one is they have is called shrapnel weapons, oh, yeah. which are really cool. Uh, kind of. Uh, Upgraded bolters that cause pinning. They're based a, a Marine's basic weapon, a bolter, yeah. right? Shooting these kind of frag rounds that explode into shrapnel, and yeah, they're they're very much up close and personal. They cause pinning. You know, it's yeah. pinning. Yeah, the regular bolters do. Oh. And and again, the concept being, I'm going to blow the, a hole in the wall. Yep. 
and then once the soft innards are exposed, I'm going to fire these rounds at the shrapnel yeah, explosions. Yeah, no, that makes yeah. sense. That's which which really plays true. exactly into their two right of wars, which yeah. again are both very much siege warfare based. Kind of the more popular one we see is called the Hammer of Olympia. This right of war lets you take um, shrapnel weapons pretty much everywhere your entire army, lets you re-roll ones to shoot those weapons, and then your vehicles can ignore crew stun and crew shaken. So that means that if, if they get hit by a weapon, they won't be stunned and shaken. To the, they're always shooting at full power. They're always moving at full power. So kind of this advance of just breaking down your walls and going at it. Yeah, this plays right into it. Just looking forward with Iron Warriors. The second one I haven't seen before, but I was reading about it. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's called the Iron Fire. Have you guys heard of this one? I read it when it first came out, I remember. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so the idea with this one is you take a bunch of um, bombard weapons. Um, the Typhon... Um, I forget the other one's called. Up the, uh, yeah, uh, you put me on the spot. I can't uh, think of it. Yeah. I can't yeah, yeah, pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I can't even pronounce it, sorry. But you're throwing out these large blast templates, and you're kind of just doing massive AoE damage. And your infantry, you actually want to shoot close to your own infantry. It makes them stubborn. You scatter less, so you're actually more accurate shooting. And then your own infantry can re-roll their saves. So you're kind of throwing your infantry at the walls as you're blasting it with kind of artillery. Interesting. Yeah, it kind of plays into that. I don't care how many of my guys die. We're going to break this siege. We're going to break through. And their infantry is so good at. They're so used to being next to that yeah. explosions that they could they take less damage from. Yeah, it and those shells really go cool. off. Yeah, that's, that's pretty really, neat. Yeah, long story short, pretty cool army. Uh, pretty strong on the tabletop. Easy to paint. Um, if you don't mind playing a, a jealous guy that <laughs> everybody kind of makes fun of, but pretty cool legion. A little undeserved, but he was. He was. A, it yeah, again, as, as the fan of the traders, I think yeah. the Emperor definitely played favoritism. He did. There was a lot of stories of, of Dorne breaking a siege and Perturabo and the Iron Warriors having to be left behind to hold that while Dorne went to the next glory, if yep. you will. And Dorne was always like, why am I always left behind? I'm better than he is. And yeah, again, the Iron Warriors didn't really follow a certain god of chaos. It was just kind of that ingrained jealousy right. and anger they had for, right, right, right. Yeah, for certain legions. That's, I, that's on my list. Um, we talked about the Allied Matrix uh, last episode, episode before, yep. when building a list. And the only, as my, my world leaders sit out here, the only legion that are like besties with the world leaders are the Iron Warriors. So only one naturally, one. I have to eventually build an Iron Warriors army so I can have a, an Allied attachment. Only ones that can stand them. <laughs> well, I mean, it actually kind of makes sense too because they're such vicious close combat fighters that they want to be in the thick of the battle. So when a wall is busted on siege, that the Iron Warriors bust the hole. They just turn the world leaders the first in. Makes right? perfect sense. Yep. Interesting. So that brings us to I think Night Lords is up next. Hey, that's me. Well, they're the Eighth <laughs> Legion. Um, their Primarch is Conrad <laughs> Kurz. I, I, I laugh because it's like Night Lords, man, they're. Dark. They're dark. Dark. All dark. They're yeah. the. I would. I would argue that they're the darkest. Do you like Halloween? Uh, because <laughs> yes. this is way worse. These than are the that. spooky boys. Do you yeah. want, uh, <laughs> want bat wings on your? Oh, so yeah. Conrad <laughs> Kurz is their Primarch. Um, he's also called the Night Haunter. Um, in his lore, um, the the planet he lands on is called Nostromo. And it's basically a perpetual night, and he ends up in the slums. He's down and never sees daylight. Um, and it's just filled with criminals and vile acts of humanity trying to scrounge through in order to survive. Um, and that's what he was born into, raised in, uh, run by criminal syndicates and things like that. Um, he eventually pacified the entire planet, but he did it by killing everybody who did anything bad. And then anybody who, they're like, well, we're not going to do anything bad anymore, and he stopped killing. Did he get the job done? He While he was there, yeah, until the Emperor found him, took him, put him, reunited with his legion, and then the whole planet went to shit again. Excuse <laughs> <It's> me. <you. laughs> <laughs> um, so based on his upbringing, um, they accept the... the the, the Night Lords, they really excel in the fields of warfare that concern infiltration and psychological warfare. Um, they rely heavily on terror tactics. Uh, I've tried to compare them to like Vlad the Impaler, yeah. where mm -hmm. they would essentially yeah, flay victims uh, and then post them on to 
posts outside of cities and let the people see that this is what happens when you cross us, cross them. Right. And I'll get to another story here in a second. Um, but their philosophy of terror made them especially useful in completing compliance actions that were used against societies that hadn't been fully brought into compliance yet. I so like, I like it's compliance actions. Compliance <laughs> actions. Well, that's what they call it. <laughs> compliance that's, action. That's what, the, that's what or it's be called. Or be flayed on a light or post. Be <laughs> or be flayed, yes. So uh, they, would, they, would, they would routinely fall behind uh, the rest of the, of the crusade that's going out and make, bringing these planets into compliance and things because they had problems in places where the more robust units or uh, loyalist legions were at and weren't able to really get the job done. They would send in the Night Lords and so they should get the job done. It's an interesting segue. There's a lot of theories that when the Emperor made all the Primarchs, they, he had a plan, almost like mm -hmm. a puzzle, and each one of these Primarchs were a different piece. Different roles. So when you start yeah. looking at and then when, the, when the, the Primarchs were lost, the Emperor still had their DNA, and he made each Legion using the DNA of the Primarchs. So the Legion themselves have the same traits as the Primarch, just not as good, essentially. So when he find when they when they went through the, during the Crusades and they found all the different Primarchs and they reunite them with the Legions, there's a Legion made already in their life. Oh yeah, and they, like they were sending in the Night Lords before they found mm -hmm. combat crews well, to, right. to do this. Because they still had that ability. Because they, they had, had the that, ability. That um, predetermined, yeah. What also helps that is that the Night Lords were made up of mostly criminals. Um, their ranks were originally filled by the Emperor from the prisons of Terra in the first iteration, and later they were filled from the prisons of Nostromo, uh, which is the home planet of the Night Lords, where uh, Cruz is from. Somebody who's not going to ask questions. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's basically, uh, the methods they employed were surgical. Uh, there's tales of empty cities where nothing was disturbed, like not even a single pane of glass was broken, and there was no signs of human life at all. But other than other flayed than people on light flayed posts, people right? on light posts. But everything was pristine. Um, so there's a story uh, that you shared with me that I thought was worth just... An old white dwarf, yeah. It just kind of sums up the Night Lords, um, but they go, to a, uh, they go to a planet and they darken the skies. I'm going to give you the abridged version. They darken the skies so the whole planet is steeped in night. Perpetual night. And then the Imperial cities have one building that's the planet wide broadcasting box network. Box mm -hmm. network. Yep. Uh, and they go there and they turn on the box network so the entire planet has to listen to it. And then they slowly flay alive every member that's in that building of the Imperial network uh, and broadcast it for days and days and weeks and just let them know what's coming. Um, so... That's what you mean by terror tactics. Terror yes. tactics. Uh, Night Lords are dark. Um, they're very cool legion in tactics-wise and more, like, for playing the game. Um, we don't have the, a local uh, player here playing Night Lords. We I don't. wish we did. I would love I kind of want to Night after Lords. deep, deep yeah. diving in. Or not you can do some in, nasty things like, with that. Yeah. And also, fun fact, uh, it could be argued that the Night Lords were the first Legion to go rogue uh, when they destroyed Nostromo because Conrad Kurz was taken prisoner after he attacked his fellow Primarch brother, uh, then decided he didn't want to wait for the Primarch to decide on his fate and escaped, went back to his home planet and destroyed it because they had devolved back into him. I think the Night Lords are a really good example, and Kurs specifically. We talked earlier about the culture kind of shaping how the Primarch kind of grew in his own outlook. Right. And being. Mortarian's a good example, too, and we'll get to him later. But growing up on a Stromo and this kind of the slums and the anarchy, he really turned dark. Now, maybe the Emperor had that in mind for him as well, but he really flourished yeah, for well, sure in that culture. Also, uh, Kurs is the only one that kind of welcomed his own death. He knew it was coming, and he I just he accepted was, it. He was part... Spoiler alert? Spoiler alert. <laughs> he, he had visions of the future, didn't he? That kind of was parts of it? I've heard that, yeah. Yes, yeah. that was part of it. Uh, but, yeah, not to give too much away, but yes, he did welcome his own death. The Legion ability uh, is called a talent for murder. Go figure. Yep. Uh, so during the uh, the sub-phase, the, sub the fight sub-phase, 
or the shooting phase, any unit that is pinned, falling back, or outnumbered by the attacking unit, the attacking unit gains a bonus to wound and poor and penetrate armor. So better bonus to wound if you're an infantry or dreadnought or anything like that. Bonus to the armor penetration roll if you're a vehicle. So if they've already beaten them, if they, they beat are, them harder. Yes. <laughs> the terror <laughs> tactics, the, uh, the, uh, the surgical, we are going to end it, you. It really plays into the, the night fighting. Uh, well, oh, yeah. That's where we're, yeah, I view, we're getting there. We're getting there. Right. The rights of war. Uh, they have two rights of war. <clears throat> one is called the Swift Blade, and this one kind of surprised me. Uh, a fast-moving mounted force on bikes, essentially. Mm. Kind of like White Scars. The Warlord is not just one person, but it is split by up to five headquarter choices. I didn't know about that. So you have to select one Praetor, and then you have to select up to four Centurions. I didn't know that either. <laughs> you, we, when you use this, you can't use a Primark, and you can't take heavy support choices or artillery units. Oh, All geez. four Centurions can be upgraded to different consoles. And also, a u- very unique thing about it is, if you have five of them, you have to kill all five of them to get the Slay the Warlord achievement. Oh, wow. That's interesting. It is, uh, comes back, it goes back to the gangs on Nostromo, the, uh-huh. like, crime lords and the syndicates where they have spread out authority and things like that. So that's where this one comes from. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. It's pretty interesting. I didn't know that they could do something like this. So, uh, the warlord thing is... The second one being Terror Assault. Uh, you alluded to this. Uh, plays into the level of terror tactics. Um, night fight automatically happens. Normally you'd have to roll for night fight if both I'm people want it. I'm not sure we've talked about night fight, but it's yeah. a pretty big effect that mm-hmm. can happen at the beginning of a game that really reduces uh, shooting uh, shooting at your opponent. Yes. You're fighting does. at night. You're fighting at dawn, basically. Not to get too into that, but normally you have to roll to see if it happens. With this right of war, it happens, and it not only happens for turn one, but it's automatic for turn two as well. You don't have to roll until turn three. To see, uh, if it goes away. to see if it goes away. Uh, it automatically drops on turn four. And terror squads and raptor squads, which are unique units for uh, the night lords, can be taken as troop choices. Uh, and, and all of their characters gain fear one, which is another rule that it basically causes penalties to morale checks. And morale checks can they run away like, easier. Yeah. They run away easier. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, the limits are you're limited to one uh, heavy support choice and you can't run a Lord of War or Super Heavy. So basically, the Night Lords don't really use a lot of tanks or, or heavy, support heavy, like, heavy support at all. Uh, they're more about the infiltration, terror tactics, swift strikes, uh, surgical things. Sure. Types, but you can, of course. And don't, yeah, don't they'll be touched on it in another episode where you don't necessarily have to take a right of war. So in theory, if you wanted to make a Night Lord's tank company, because they sure had tanks. They sure had. Everybody had everything. Yeah, yes. um, You could not take one of these right of wars and still run. That's just if you're going to go a fluff route. Really leaning into the narrative. Right. Yeah. That's so, awesome. That's Night Lords. Yeah, they're pretty dang cool. Like I said, I, I don't know a lot about them because we don't have one in our community and I'm a nope. player, so I don't get to play them. So you much. guys and I hate out writers, there so. can tell uh, tell bedtime <laughs> stories to make sure your kids don't do anything about the Night Lords. <laughs> about the Night Lords. <laughs> and, and their appearance is pretty cool. You know, it's a deep blue, a lot of lightning bolts, a lot of like spooky, yes. like, like there's a lot of the bat wings or you know, skull motifs. Or right? and, a lot of skulls. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of in their aesthetic. That was even general. before they were traitors. That's just yeah. It stuck just, after they were traitors too. That's, that's just them. Yeah, exactly. well, yeah. <laughs> Everything I've said is before they go. They go. Yeah, there's the loyalists at that point. And they they are good guys. I would say that they're yeah, kind of unique also when it comes to the the ones that went traitor because they don't actually follow chaos either. They shun pretty much everything. They're just like we just want to kill. Point us in the right direction. Life is pointless. Life is <laughs> pointless. Are they emo? Is that what you're saying? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. All right. So I think that uh, that brings us to the world eaters. I haven't heard of the wor- world eaters. Yeah, okay. it's almost... I I really wish we didn't have one of those. Do we have a local player? I think we do. You might. 
So the world leaders. <laughs> yeah, let's talk He's about been the world leaders. For this. Yeah. <laughs> so world leaders are clearly my favorite faction. Uh, I'll, I'll start by saying I've got about four or five thousand points painted up for world leaders now. I put them out here to to check them out. My 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 cool little tanks and my cool little uh, my dreadnoughts. Lork the first, who Very is cool. actually a warhound, which we'll get to in a second. He's not actually a world leader, but he was awakened during the rebellion inside the world leaders. But um, so the world leaders legion, uh, originally known as the warhounds. And by the way, I just ripped my stuff right off of Wiki, so I'm just going to read you guys from Wiki again. Great source. <laughs> That's a great source. Go to Wiki, <laughs> read up. Yeah. Originally known as the warhounds, they're the twelfth legion of the original twenty space marine legions of the first founding. Their Primarch is Angron, originally Angronius of Nuceria. The Warhounds, prior to finding their Primarch, performed with almost lethal savagery, tearing apart whenever, whatever enemy they were given to fight without mercy or falter, heedless of the risk and uncaring of the Legion's own losses. So even before they found Angron, they were pretty angry boys. Uh, when Angron was found on Nuceria, it's a slave world that used captives to fight in uh, to the death in arena kind of gladiatorial arenas for amusement of the planet's overlords. At one point, he finally broke free and led a revolt with his slave army that he had named the Eater of Cities. Mm -hmm. um, and when he was about to, they, they fought, and they fought well, and they, but they finally all the overlords of this planet came together and were about to wipe them out. He's standing on a hilltop with his brothers and sisters, gives this rousing speech, in the morning we're going to die. They all dug their own graves and to make sure that the warring warlords, the, the, the warlords coming at them would know that there's going to be, we're going to fight to the death, this is over. And the Emperor shows up. And he ruined it. He shows up <laughs> and he pulls Angron out and he tells him, this is your legion, leave this behind. And he says, no, send me back. And he wouldn't send him back. So he got to watch all of his brothers and sisters get wiped out. Did that make him angry? Angrier. Uh, <laughs> because... Uh, Let's see here. So when he was when he when he had been enslaved, and this one this is definitely a spoiler, and I'm not going to talk about it. But when you read the book, uh, Angron, uh, Slave in Nuceria, it gives the backstory of what his puzzle piece was supposed to be. And when he was in on Nuceria and he's in these slave pits, they installed these neural implants that were called the butcher's nails, That's and right. the butcher's nails uh, inhibit all emotion. Other and then they magnify rage and anger and then whoever has them it makes the only way you can it, it gives them significant pain and the only way that pain goes away is if they're fighting if they're killing if they're slaughtering so it's it was an implant literally designed to make pit fighters better pit fighters and then they put it in a primark so he was clearly the best pit fighter to a point where he you know took over and, and created this the slave revolt so out of the gate he hated the emperor like he did not want to go back. He was he was given his legion. He's like, I, I don't want these. I want to go back. Let me go die with my brothers and sisters. And then as he started finding out that a lot of the other legions, a lot of the other primarchs were allowed to take their top consuls, their top uh, army soldiers, generals, whatever, from the planet they were found. And the emperor let his die on the planet instead of letting him take them. So when eventually when Horus went to Angron and said. You want to join Have a rebellion? <laughs> He's like, yes, I do. Yes, Sign I do. me up right now. Um, eventually, the, the Butcher's Nails, when they were first putting them into the Legion, they were not... What, so when the Legion Apothecaries, I'm sorry, let me rewind. The Legion Apothecaries tried to, the medics basically tried to duplicate, replicate the implants and put them in the Marines. They wouldn't take... They, they, they would just kill each Marine they put in. They tried to put them in their psychers, and the psychers' heads would explode and they'd kill you know, a thousand Marines and blow off the side of the ship. So they finally figured out how to put Butcher's Nails in, which was a large rebellion that happened inside of the they world. They did leaders. that more than once? Yeah, they tried over and over. Um, so it's, it's in that you get me going, homie. I'll go all night. Yeah, long. But the reason, the reason there are no psychers later in on is because all the other world leaders hated the psychers yep. that were in the force because they didn't have the Butcher's Nails. So they didn't feel that pain and that rage. So they were resentful of the psychers inside their legion. Can you still have psychers in a world leader's army? 100% you Absolutely. can. But... The rest of them don't like them. <laughs> Let's see. So, during the Horus Heresy, uh, the Legion is fighting the Butcher's Nails on a regular basis and, and losing. Like, they're literally slipping into madness. These things were meant to be put into regular humans. They were not meant to be put into Primarchs or Space Marines. Angron doesn't lead this Legion. 
Like he, I, I make the joke all the time. Like if they're about to go assault a planet, all the captains and all the the companies are laid out. Angron comes in, he's like, "Kill Baden Marin, and then he runs out the door. And Karn, the captain of the eighth company, steps up and he's like, "All right, this is what we're going to do. You guys go do this. You guys do this." And Karn was trying to keep the Legion together as he was splintering because they had all the butcher's nails put in. Uh, eventually, Angron, and this is. Huge spoiler alert, the Battle of Nuceria, which is what my army's based off of. Uh, Angron essentially becomes aligned with the Chaos God, uh, Korn, the God of hatred and rage and anger, which kind of, it's a perfect thing. Yeah. What is it? Uh, uh, carrots and peas and peas and corn. <laughs> it's fit together perfectly and, uh, and really doomed the Legion to the madness that was ahead of them. I've said it before, the world leaders in 40k, pretty one-dimensional, pretty boring. They're just berserk, crazy killers. Skulls for the skull throne. In the Horus Heresy, in, in my mind, the most tragic story. The, the, the butcher's nails be put into Angron, Karn trying to keep the Legion together. It's it's phenomenal. Their play style in Horus Heresy? A little one-dimensional. Still the same. Yeah, right? A little <laughs> one-dimensional. But at least now, there, I mean, they, you can still have psychers. You can still have some of yes. these things that you can't have in, in 40k. So their army-wide special rule is that uh, in, in the game of Horus Heresy, when when one unit charges another unit, the amount of dice you roll when you attack in close combat, your attack dice, you get a plus one attack when you charge. The world leaders get an additional plus one attack when they charge. So if you have a unit that each model has three attacks... They charge. They don't go up four attacks. They go up five attacks. So yeah. there's a there's a common uh, saying in Horus Heresy: if you want to beat world leaders, charge them. If you don't, you're going to lose to world leaders. Don't let them. Don't charge let you. them charge you. Right. Um, and then the other cool upgrade they get is uh, most legionnaires either can be purchased or can or come with a chain sword, which has its own great abilities. The step up from a chain sword is a chain axe that most legions have to pay extra points for to get that chain axe. World leaders get that upgrade for free. So all of your legionnaires can be running around with chain axes, which is pretty cool. Um, the rights of war are the first one. Again, lends right into the, the nails biting is the term as they're losing control, running across the battlefield. and Some are trying to keep in formation and do their thing and, and fight like Space Marine legions do instead of just losing control, running across the yep. field. It's called Berserk Assault, and what it does is increases the speed of uh, world leader units as they're running across the table, which is huge, because if I can get to you faster while you're shooting at me, the more they get there, the more damage I do when I get there. Um, but the negative of the, uh, of the uh, right of war is you, you, you lose a lot of abilities as a player as to what they can do in the assault phase. You can't charge whatever unit you want it might be more beneficial for me to get into close combat with that unit, but I have to charge the closest unit. And if this unit's closer, I have to go at that because I'm insane. I'm going crazy. I've lost my faculties, if you will. And that's everything. Even your snipers in the back oh, yeah. would have to just charge. So it says an eligible unit, and you can't charge when you fire a heavy weapon. So when the, if the so snipers are fired, yeah, okay. if, the sni if the snipers are fired, they can't declare a charge. But if, if a unit is eligible to declare a charge, and your maximum charge distance is 12 inches in the game. You've got to do it. If I'm 11 and 7 eighths inches away, I have to declare a charge. Yep. It's so, so you say you don't get charged by them, but they're faster and they have more attacks when they do charge. Yes. Okay. Right. Easier yep. said than done. Right. Yes. Yeah. It, it makes it a little one-dimensional playing them, uh, but there's some fun... Tactics. We'll do a deep dive into world leaders later. Do you guys mind if I take that episode? Yeah, I think you could, I okay. think you can have that. Uh, <laughs> I thought about it, but I'll. Yeah, yeah. It, so. <laughs> yeah, I know you love those traits. <laughs> um, their other uh, uh, right of war is Crimson Path, and it kind of lends to the the thought process of them not feeling pain when they're running across the table as they're taking damage. So they're you know, that this right of war gives you a lot of bonuses in taking less damage when you're being shot at or uh, in any phase, any damage you're taking is reduced by a little. And then your characters themselves uh, gain an ability that allows them to not feel pain as much. Um, unfortunately, that, so the, that first right of war, the, the other negative about it is you can't take any allies whatsoever that berserk assault when we have to charge the closest, which kind of bums me out because I do want to take an allied detachment with, uh, especially with uh, word bearers that we'll get to later. Um, but you can't with that right of war, and this right of war, uh, you 
you have to have more infantry units than you do tanks or non-infantry units, which isn't that big of a deal. But you also, this is kind of a big negative in this right of war, you can't take as many uh, heavy choices. And your heavy choices are generally your heavy support units that are sitting back laying down, covering big, big fire firepower yeah. for the units that are running across the table. So, oh, like the night ones. Right. It's, it's not a very popular right of war with this force, mm -hmm. uh, just because the, the plus to the movement that Berserk Assault gets is great. The Crimson Path, sure, I'm taking a little less damage, but if you have big guns shooting at me and there's no threat behind me that you have to deal with, you're going to shoot at my... Doesn't really work out. My, my infantry yeah. run across the table, so it's not as great. But yeah, so an army of world leaders, um, it's real easy to lean into uh, just a lot of close combat units running across the table. But it wouldn't always be that way. Like you would have, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the benefits of Berserk Assault is one of the, the main battle tanks of the Space Marines. It's called the Predator Tank, and you can take up to three heavy support Predator tanks as a heavy support choice. Mm -hmm. They actually, it moves to the slot fast attack. So you could actually take way more heavy support tanks when you take Berserk Assault, which is kind of cool. Um, so you can take heavy support tanks, you can take dreadnoughts, you can take, uh, I have a, I run a little recon squad in my, in my uh, world leaders. So they would have all these different units, uh, but they lend way more towards the close combat, the fast, get there. Hit him with an axe. Hit him, with a, hit him right in the face with an axe. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's probably where we should cut it for this one. Okay, it's a good spot. Yeah, that's, uh, we're about halfway through. You guys got anything you want to say about uh, Nightlords? Or about Nightmares leaders. World Leaders? Yeah. A quick question for you. What part did they really play in the heresy after um, Angron joined Hair Chorus? Was he... Oh, they were always the... Were the they front, on Terra? The front assault. They were on Terra, yep. Um, you can't... Without a pretty big spoiler alert, I can't really tell you much about Angron, uh, what happens to him on this area. But uh, Betrayer is a phenomenal book. I tell people a lot of times, if they're going to read um, the Horus Heresy, I think it's pretty important. Some people say the first three... Uh, I say the first four mm -hmm. books, and then after that, you can kind of skip around. And there are a handful of, uh, of great uh, content creators on the internet that have made their own list of what books to read in what order, okay. instead yeah. of just the normal order they were released in. And there's even books you can skip that are kind of worthless. Um, I hate to say it, but it's true. But uh, but Betrayer uh, is the book about the when Angron finally returns to his original home slave planet, Nusaria, most people that I talk to, and I'm not just being biased here, say it's probably one of the best books. It's, uh, uh, I've heard that. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a it's yeah. phenomenal book. You haven't read it yet? I'm working on it. I've got a baby on the way. I, I've got things going on. Maybe baby's not here yet. Your priorities are really messed up right now. I'm trying to get 3,000 points painted so we can do <laughs> battle reports. <laughs> That's valid. <laughs> That's valid. All right. Uh, well... Who wants to wrap it up? Jay, you I, want to wrap it up? I'll take Steve, it. you want to wrap it up? All right. So if you like what we're doing here, um, if you like our content and want to see more, like, comment, follow, and subscribe. Uh, if you want to support us and help grow our ability to create uh, better content, make sure to check our Patreon and the link posted below. Um, again, Wobbly Goblin Adventures. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. All right. And next episode, we're diving into the uh, rest of the Trader Legions. Rest of the Trader yeah. Legions. If we have to. We do. We do. We're Although getting... the best ones already gone by. Oh yeah. no, we're getting to it. <laughs> anyway, good night. We'll see you guys. Thanks, guys. I actually shortened.